This is the city, Los Angeles, California. It's a fine place to enjoy life. There are places reserved just for kids when they're young and feel young. Places they go when they're young and feel old, beginning the big search for something that often doesn't exist in the places they look for it. They might find it here, or here, or maybe here. They could try looking here. Their search might end with a college degree. One thing sure, whatever they're looking for cannot be found inside a number five capsule. When they try, that's where I come in. I carry a badge. It was Tuesday, March 15th. It was fair in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile narcotics. My partner's Bill Gannon. The boss is Captain Ritchie. My name's Friday. A powerful new drug capable of producing weird and dangerous hallucinations had found its way onto the streets of the city. It had fallen into the hands of juvenile experimenters. We had to try and stop it. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Skipper. Woman who phoned in the complaint said he was painted up like an Indian. Yeah? Said she never saw a kid do what he was doing. What's that, Skipper? Chewing the bark off a tree. 2.08 p.m. Bill and I left Georgia Street Juvenile and headed for 1200 Loma Linda Avenue. It was eight blocks from the office. It took us four and a half minutes to reach the vacant lot where the strange behaving juvenile was reported to have been seen. Stand still. Reality, man, reality. I, I could see the center of the earth. Purple flame down there, the pilot light. All the way down. The purple flame down there, the pilot light. Pilot light of... He's clean, oh, Joe. Creation, Except reality. For these. Reality. What's your name, son? You can see my name if you look hard enough. Come on now, what's your name? Don't you know my name? My name's Blue Boy. What do you think, Joe? Cardwheels? Sugar cubes. I'll make you book. He's been dropping that acid we've been hearing about. All right, son, you're under arrest. It's our duty to advise you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent, and any statement you make may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed before any questioning. Do you understand that? There I am. I'm over there now. I'm not here anymore. My hair is green, and I'm a tree. You ever see anybody this torn up? Well, it's a sense he's not strung out on sugar cubes. Yeah. All right. Let's take him to central receiving. Come on, son. Even if your body does die, your mind will live on. Yeah, we know. Come on. You're the dirty disbelievers. The evil disbelievers. Evil! 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 Right, come on, son. Settle down. Brown, blue, yellow, green, green, orange, red. Red, red, red. I can hear them. I can hear them all. Yeah, sure you can, kid. Let's go back to the office. We'll all listen. 2.20 p.m. We took the subject to Central Receiving Hospital. The examining doctor pronounced him under the influence of an unknown drug. 3 p.m. We drove back to Juvenile Division. We took the subject upstairs to the narcotics unit. He appeared to be a little calmer, but it was impossible to tell if the effects of the drug were substantially wearing off. He would not tell us what drug he had taken. He still refused to give us his name. We filled Captain Ritchie in, and once again, we advised the subject of his constitutional rights. I know my rights, man. I don't want a lawyer, and I don't need a lawyer. There's no law against what I did. There's a law against taking drugs. Uh, not my kind, man. Not my kind. <laughs> You're pretty high and far out, aren't you? What kind of kick are you on, son? Oh, it's, it's weird. What about these? Those are keys to the kingdom. Anything special about these cubes? I'm on the train. 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 We're crossing over, we're crossing over, we're crossing over, we're crossing over on the train. On the train, on the train, 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 the train. Now you stay put in that chair. I am the chair. I am the chair. 
chair. I am the 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 we talked to forensic chemist Ray Murray. We filled him in on the subject's appearance and his behavior pattern. Tell us about the stuff, Ray. Visual distortions, strangely disoriented. It's a relatively new drug developed in Switzerland virtually by accident. A Swiss biochemist by the name of Hoffman came up with the first synthesis of the drug in 1938. Yeah. Lysergic acid diethylamide tartrate, LSD-25. What's it look like, Ray? LSD's odorless, colorless, tasteless. Comes in two forms, liquid and powder. I'll run these sugar cubes through, but I can tell you right now, they contain LSD. Narcotics divisions handled a couple of cases like yours in the past few weeks. Even had one where they put the stuff on the backs of postage stamps. Is it habit forming? It's new, Bill. We can't be sure about physical addiction, but one thing we're certain of. Yeah. In every case so far, every one of the individuals has had a psychological dependence on it. You tell me, which is worse? Are the effects recurrent, would you know? Definitely a transient recurrence from what we've seen so far. User over in the county jail, been there six months. Two days ago, the man showed most of the symptoms of having just had a fresh shot of the stuff. Hard to believe. Unlike heroin, which slows down metabolism, or alcohol, which is a depressant, the users of LSD have the mistaken idea that it activates them, quickens their mental lives. Yeah, like painting yourself up like an Indian, trying to chew the bark off a tree, burying your head in a hole. Users believe they're turning into monsters. They want to destroy themselves, yet have no urge to commit suicide. They experience the vilest of garish, frightening hallucinations. They suffer extreme nausea, severe vomiting, aches and pains, anxiety, panic, depression. Sounds like it's going to be a big problem. If it isn't, it'll do till one comes along. Joe, Bill, the real issue here is the degree of danger this drug presents to the psychological health of the user, along with the resultant effect of the user and those around them. And as of now, there's no law covering the sale and use of LSD. In the number of cases coming through this lab, I'd say they better give you people something to work with damn soon. <laughs> 4 p.m., Bill and I left the crime lab and headed back toward Georgia Street Juvenile. Before we left him, Ray Murray filled us in on more facts and figures. A kilo of LSD, two and two-tenths pounds, can be divided into five to ten million doses. Murray also gave us one last frightening fact. LSD is so potent that a single pound of the preparation could turn every person in Los Angeles County into a total psychotic. The population of the county, seven million people. It was 4.15 p.m. when we arrived back at Juvenile Division. What'd you find out? Well, according to Murray, the Carver boys on LSD. Figured sooner or later, didn't it? How's it falling into the hands of youngsters like that boy? I don't know, Skipper. Stuff selling for eight to ten bucks a cap. Come on in the office. Boy's parents are here and they're not too happy. Mr. and Mrs. Carver, Sergeant Friday, Officer Gannon. All right, Mr. Mr. Carver. I arrested my boy? That's right, Mr. Carver. Give me one good reason why. Drug intoxication. Well, that's impossible. We believe it to be a powerful hallucinogen called LSD. You people trying to say my boy's a drug addict? No, sir, we didn't say he was addicted to the drug, but he certainly was intoxicated from it when we picked him up. Now, look, I've heard about this LSD, and it's my understanding it hasn't done anybody any harm. If you could have seen your boy a couple hours ago, I doubt you'd feel that way. And look at him now. He always go around painted up like that, half his face blue, half yellow. Well, I thought you men were supposed to be experts with young people. It's... Probably a high school initiation or something. The boys are always doing some silly thing or other, letting their hair grow long or dressing up like those English singers. Here, Benji, wipe your face and let's go home. I know how you feel. I've got two kids of my own. I wouldn't want to find either one of them in a police station. But we're holding your boy for his own safety and maybe the safety of others. Well, what do you mean you're holding him? There's no law against what the boy did. You act like he was taking heroin or smoking marijuana. Now, you're not putting my boy in any jail. He's not going to have any police record. If we can't settle this right now, maybe my attorneys can. That's your privilege, Mr. Carver. But the boy's going to be detained at Juvenile Hall. He'll have a hearing and the judge will decide. All right. You insist on doing it the hard way. I happen to know there's no law against LSD. There's a law against being in a highly intoxicated state under the influence of any drug or narcotic. And your boy was and probably still is to some extent. Nonsense. You're fine, aren't you, son? Just fine, Ma. There, you can see for yourselves. Come on, Benji, we're taking you home. Book him for 601. <laughs> The subject, Benjamin Carver, was booked under Section 601 of the Welfare and Institution Code, in danger of leading an idle, dissolute, or immoral life. He was being held for his own protection. 
Tuesday, May 10th, 5.30 p.m., the subject's case was heard in the Los Angeles County Juvenile Courts building. There was no law covering possession of lysergic acid diethylamide. However, the petition was sustained for 601 WIC. Benji Carver was placed on probation and released to his parents. <laughs> Satisfied, Sherlock? Thursday, May 12th, 3.58 p.m. Bill and I had been out on a routine follow-up. When we returned to the squad room, Sergeants Gene Zappi and Dominic Carr were questioning two female juveniles. A policewoman was standing by. This should interest you. Girls, this is Sergeant Friday and Officer Bill Gannon. It's Edna May and it's Sandy. Tell Sergeant Friday and his partner what you were telling us. You mean about our trip? First, tell him how old you are. I'm 15. What are you now? 13? No, you know I'm 14. I just had my birthday last week. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Edna May's 14. Go on, Sandy. I saw all these weird colors. And then I saw an eye. You know what I mean? A human eye. It kept coming closer and closer. Then all of a sudden, everything started to melt. You know, just melt and run down. The sidewalk melted, the street melted, just everything. LSD. Both of them. Dropped a cap apiece, paid three bucks for him. Where'd they get him? Young friend of yours. Edna May, tell Sergeant Friday where you got the caps. We got him from Blue Boy. That's what they call him, just Blue Boy. Benji Carver. And they were capsules, you said? Yeah, little white ones. I think I'm going to be sick again. Please help me. Both of them were in awful shape a couple hours ago. Nausea, vomiting. It was all right going out on the trip, but coming back's a little rough, isn't it? Terrible. Just awful. I'm so sick. My head still aches. And my stomach hurts so much. Head to May. Can you read this? No. No, I can't. It, it's all swimmy. Everything seems to be moving around. How long ago did you take the stuff, Edna May? This morning. I forget what time. Me and Sandy, we, we did school today. We couldn't have gone anyway after we took it. Sergeant Carr. Come on, Edna. Three bucks a cap. When it drops to 50 cents, the kids in grammar school will have themselves a big time at recess, won't they? Really getting popular. You seen that bus up on the strip, Friday, Saturday nights? Big sign on it says, can you pass the acid test? Pay a dollar and find out. For a buck, they drive you up the Hollywood Hills to an acid party. Before we're through, they'll be listing it in the yellow pages, for you just nail them for possession. How long does it take to mix a batch of acid? A couple of days? Yeah, about that. Takes a little longer to stir up a law, doesn't it? Wednesday, October 5th. Six months went by. LSD users were increasing at an alarming rate, particularly among juveniles. By now, the users had established their own language. The drug itself was now called the ticket, the ghost, the beast, the chief, the hawk, or simply 25. Users now referred to themselves as acid heads or acid freaks. A trip still referred to having taken the drug, but now more often the words a bum trip and freak out were being heard, meaning a bad LSD experience. The pusher or supplier became known as the travel agent. The acid heads came up with another new wrinkle. After consuming LSD, it requires from 45 minutes to an hour for the drug to take effect. Most users were now spending this waiting period inhaling marijuana. 9 a.m. Bill and I reported in for work as usual. It was beginning to look like any other Wednesday. Federal and state, you're in business. In the California book, you'll find it on page 38. Division 10.5, Chapter 1, Section 11901. Lysergic acid diethylamide has now been classified as a dangerous drug. When does the law go into effect? 48 hours. Monday, October 10th, 2.35 p.m. It had been six months since Bill and I first picked up the subject, Benji Carver. During all those months, the name Blue Boy kept turning up in arrest reports as a major supplier of LSD. Picked this one up in the Third Street Tunnel. Didn't want to leave. Thought he was a mole. Holding some acid, six caps. Name's Teddy Carstairs. Who's your travel agent, Teddy? I already told you. Tell us again. Why? Now look, we advised you of your rights, and you agreed to talk to us, didn't you? Yeah. 
Well, talk to us. Tell us who you bought your tickets from. The blue boy. You willing to testify to that? Well, what's that mean? You willing to swear to it in a court of law? Why not? Are you telling us yes? Well, wouldn't you if you was me? How's that? Well, that stinking blue boy. And I paid good bread for that, too. Yeah. That freak, he sold me two bum trips. With the willingness of Teddy Carstairs to testify against Benji Carver, a complaint was issued and a warrant was obtained from the district attorney. 4.30 p.m., we drove up to number 17 Eagle Crest Drive, Benji Carver's home. His mother told us he had moved out three months ago. She had no idea where we might locate him. What's he done this time? Can you tell me? Yes, ma'am. He's been selling dangerous drugs to a minor. You mean another minor, don't you, Sergeant? No, ma'am. He's 18. When we find him, he'll be tried as an adult. That's the law in this state. I see. I don't suppose I have to tell you two men. My husband and I both owe you an apology. That's all right, ma'am. We understand. I, um, I wonder if you'd do me a favor when you find him. What's that, Miss Carr? Tell him we still love him. Before we left, we asked Mrs. Carver if we could check the house. She was cooperative and agreed. Bill and I searched the premises. We found nothing. Friday, December 9th, 8.30 p.m. We figured the Sunset Strip might be a good place to dig up a lead. Since the warrant on Benji Carver was registered and in the hands of all units, we hoped it wouldn't be too long before the suspect was picked up. The parade of teenagers begins at Laurel Canyon and Sunset and ends at Doheny. On Friday and Saturday nights for most of the young people in the city, the strip had become the in place to go. It had also become the scene of teenage riots. 8.45 p.m., Bill and I showed Benji Carver's mugshots to the sheriff's deputies who patrol the Sunset Strip. 8.53 p.m., a couple of them thought they recognized him, but they weren't sure. Sergeant Friday! Sandy, Edna May, what's happening? Nothing much. Been behaving yourselves? Haven't touched any more of that acid, that's for sure. We were even invited to an acid party tonight. We told him no. We're on our way home. You told who no? Blue boy. He asked us. Do you have the address? Yeah, someplace. It's supposed to be up in the hills somewhere. You gonna break up the party? It's about time somebody tried, don't you think? At 18 p.m., Bill and I drove up to the address given us by the two girls. It was in the Hollywood Hills. It was an old house that had seen better days. They must be way out to leave the door unlocked. That's weed. there to turn them on for years. Must be at least a hundred caps. Marijuana. Hey, man. Hey, 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 All right, hold it down. Hey, Quiet. Hey, hey, Police hey, officers, you're under arrest. Hold it. Stay right where you are. Freeze. All of you, keep your hands in plain sight. You, on your feet. Come on. All right, now sober up and try to listen to this. It's our duty to advise you of your constitutional rights. Now, you have the right to remain silent, and any statement you make may be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed before any questioning. Now, do you understand that? I do, man. I understand it. I'm the one you want to talk to, because I sure understand it. Well, fine. Suppose you climb down off of there and come over here and talk to me. 
Talk to me about Blue Boy. He's super seen, man. Is he coming back? No, man. Dig this seat table? We're in power. Suppose you go over there and sit down. Bill, I'll call the office, get a couple of black and whites up here to take them in. Right. You're not going to search me. No, but a policewoman will. What's that address? Keep your nose out of my purse. Keep yours out of the acid. Next time I will. Right. I got it. Thanks. Bill. A call came into the office an hour ago. A drugstore over on Vermont. According to them, they did a little business with a guy who fits in the description of the Carver boy. What kind of business? 3,000 empty number five caps. Before we left the house, we arranged for a stakeout in the event the Carver boy should return. 11.40 p.m. It took us 12 minutes to get to the Apex Pharmacy at Vermont and Wilcox. The pharmacist's name was Ben Riddle. We showed him a group of mug shots. Oh, here's the fella right here. Yeah, that's him, all right. Benji Carver. Here's the address where we delivered the capsules. Just a few blocks from here. Thanks, Mr. Riddle. You've been a big help. Uh, what do you fellas figure he's going to put in all those empty capsules? A lot of misery. It was midnight when we arrived at the Macon Apartments on West Beverly Boulevard. We got the manager out of bed. That's right. Benji Carver. He's in the apartment over there, 107. He in now, would you know? I should say so. I was going to call you people until they quieted down about an hour ago. They? That's right. Sounds to me as though he's got another boy in there with him. And the two of them were really whooping it up. I see. Do you have a pass key we could borrow? Yes, I do. Here, this one will do. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank welcome. you. I'll cover the window, Joe. All right. Police officer, what's your name? Philip Jameson. How old are you? 18. Poor Benji. Look at him. What's the matter with him? He's been like that for over an hour. He had some kind of a fit. And then he got quiet. Look at this, Joe. Acid, reds, yellows, rainbows. Those are Benji's. He's been taking them all day. Just kept saying he wanted to get further out. Further out. Further out. Just kept saying he wanted to get further out. Well, he made it. He's dead. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 15th, a coroner's inquest was held at the county morgue, Hall of Justice, City and County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that inquest. At the inquest, the coroner's jury ruled that the 18-year-old suspect had administered himself an overdose of lysergic acid diethylamide in combination with various barbiturates and had thus taken his own life. Thank you.